Stop politicizing the science. Tests of scientific literacy show that the deniers are no less knowledgeable than the believers. Vaccines are probably one of the best things our species has ever done. The prospect of nuclear war would be so unthinkable, quite literally lead to the extinction of the human species. One could worry that once that taboo has been breached, once the line had been crossed, many things to fear. He is the Harvard professor, Steven Pinker. This lack of separation between the executive and the judiciary, so Trump being able to elect three officials onto the Supreme Court. The United States already is behind the curve in terms of global progress. The reduction in absolute poverty in the last 200 years, 95% to now something like 13. The moral imperative is not that everyone have the same. The moral imperative is that everyone has enough. This is The Loaf Podcast. Welcome back to The Bakery, everyone, where we break bread with the world's finest. Today, we're very lucky to be here with Dr. Steven Pinker. He's a cognitive psychologist at Harvard, and he's a prolific author known best for being a public intellectual, but he needs no introduction. Steven, thank you so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Stephen, before we get into the depth of what we want to talk to you about. We have a practice as with the Loaf podcast with all our guests and we find out it's actually quite a good way to get to know someone and we ask you what your favorite bread is. So far away. Oh, uh, I would have to say Montreal bagels. I come from Montreal and uh, there we are famous for a kind of bagel that uh, apparently mm-hmm. you can get nowhere else. And there are two competing Bagel factories, factories meaning small storefronts across the street from each other in Uh, the old Jewish district of Montreal where my father grew up and visitors to Montreal are well advised to line up for bagels fresh out of the brick oven. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode. I just wanted to drop you in a word from our sponsor Manscaped. You can use the discount code LOAF to get your discount because even a lion needs to tame its mane. Get the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra from Manscaped now. Stay fresh with no cuts so that your baguette leaves no crumbs. It's good to know there's that um, diversity because I've only ever really heard of the New York bagel. And I love bagels, but you'd say it's, you'd far, say it's significantly oh, far, better. Far inferior. <laughs> and there's no, no biases there. None at, at all. all. So talking about biases and rationality, let's get straight into it. So your most recent book, Rationality, what it is, why it seems scarce. Um, One of the main things you talk about or something that struck me and that I agree with a lot is um, an inability for people to be able to distinguish between peer reviewed scientific data and, um, you know, sort of pseudo scientific fear mongering. And a key example, the one that struck me is with nutrition online. You have the carnivore diet vegan diet, paleo, et cetera, et cetera. How do you think we can uh, remedy trust in the scientific establishment and help to educate people uh, in being able to distinguish between misinformation on the internet in, in that way? What are the, first of all, scientists can't present themselves as just another priesthood, just delivering edicts from on high, because then mm. when they're wrong, which inevitably they will be, because no one's infallible, no one's omniscient, we start out ignorant of everything. So mm-hmm. scientists do their best based on available data, but you know, data are bound to change. If it is uh, their expertise is presented as, trust me, I'm a scientist, then as soon as they have to change their mind, they discredit themselves. So one uh, crucial uh, uh, qualification is to show, your, show, show their work. The, the reason that we are recommending this is because of uh, this study, that study, and so on. I mean, it, you know, succinctly and, and as uh, honestly and clearly as possible. The second one is um, stop politicizing the, the science, where I think the scientific mainstream has gone wildly off in the wrong direction by dec- basically uh, what journal after journal, uh, organization after organization is ex- um, uh, proclaiming their fealty to uh, a so-called social justice agenda, what is derisively called uh, wokeness, and scientists are discrediting themselves if they advertise we are a branch of the political left, because then everyone who's not on the political left will just blow them off. And and we have reason to believe from studies of uh, uh, departure from scientific mainstream beliefs, that is, people who reject uh, 
evolution, people who reject uh, the, the, the uh, idea that human activity is warming the planet. Uh, most scientists would, will say, oh, they're scientifically illiterate. We need to increase science education and have more science talking heads on the BBC. But tests of scientific literacy show that the deniers are no less knowledgeable than the, than the believers. A lot of people who believe in climate change or believe in, in um, Darwin's theory of natural selection are, are pretty clueless in how it actually works or what it actually consists of. But just they know that it's that, that good right thinking people believe it, so they believe it too. I and mean, that's just, that's the way humans work. Uh, but what it means is that if science gets branded as a left-wing uh, exercise, then people who aren't on the left will, will blow it off. And that is a big danger in acceptance of scientific consensus. And it's one that scientists themselves seem to be oblivious to. It's interesting in that the politicization of things like vaccines, I find quite curious because you'd, you'd imagine uh, a vaccine is is something scientific. The fact that something like that can be partisan uh, for me, it, it blows my mind. So I was, I was wondering, you, you speak about what you label conspiracies and, um, for example, anti-vax movements and how new sources trust is eroding at the moment in new sources in America. Uh, I was, I was wondering, would you be able to steel man the case against vaccination? So I, I would, for example, say an argument for personal liberty. Would you be able to steel man the case against vaccination and then perhaps offer a counter argument? So why vaccines are the way to go? Yeah, the uh, you know, vaccines are just as, as background. They really they probably one of one of the best things our species has ever done. Uh, so that, that is that is that is I the agree. background just because it, vaccines have, by all accounts, saved you know, literally hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of lives. Uh, now, the steel man case against vaccines, one could say, one could ask, uh, well, one could note that, that uh, like everything, vaccines can have side effects. There are some people who have a, a reaction. But if you, um, and one could legitimately ask, what is the, what are the boundaries of governmental coercion? That is, uh, we don't want a totalitarian government that can do anything that bureaucrats or politicians seem uh, desirable? Uh, is the skin a boundary that the government may not um, uh, uh, invade, may not pass? So the government can tell us not to speed, uh, not to, to, to rob and kill each other, but it can't tell us what we can inject into the, the fluids and tissues of our own body. That, that would be a, a legitimate uh, or uh, conceivable argument against, certainly against mandatory or uh, highly um, incentivized vaccines. The argument on the other side is that when you, um, at least your, or when your child in the school, for example, is not vaccinated, it's not just a question of uh, what they're uh, exposing themselves to, but they are putting other people at, at risk. And so in that regard, not being vaccinated is in some ways akin to driving drunk or recklessly or um, <clears throat> uh, it, spewing toxic waste out of your, uh, your, your chimney. That is, it, it affects others and government has a le legitimate role in protecting others. Now, how that, uh, you know, I, I don't, wouldn't want the vaccine police to drag people out against their will and, uh, uh, and, and, and jam uh, needles into their arms. But, um, uh, but, but uh, a mandate saying that you, that, uh, you could not enter this public space, so you could not uh, uh, enjoy this privilege without being vaccinated. At least the argument could be made. The argument could be had that, uh, is this a slippery slope uh, to government coercion if you were to allow that? And I, I, you know, I would say that is a, uh, not a trivial issue to, to adjudicate. How far can the government go in, in the guise of protecting other people against the inaction of people who might be spreading an infectious disease. But certainly the case for vaccination would be that it, even acknowledging the um, uh, potential for side effects, the cost benefit ratio is so uh, staggering in terms of the amount of death and suffering that it prevents, that just as with anything that we do, there's bound to be uh, uh, some people who are worse off, but if the vast majority are, uh, are, are better off, and if the 
uh, harms even to the people who are worse off are minor, then that would speak for uh, at the very least encouraging and in the strongest case requiring or at least highly incentivizing. Yeah, I think it's the, the middle principle, uh, the harm principle that you can you can do anything as long as it doesn't harm others, which would kind of then stop the slippery slope argument. But uh, I do think it becomes a little bit more complicated when you, when we're bringing COVID and for example, this idea of third booster shots and a lot of people had this um <laughs> This feeling that young people were told to get a lot of vaccines, which might not necessarily make a difference, or they thought there wasn't enough research behind it. Whereas for me, something like polio is definitely much more self-evident that everyone should be taking the vaccine. So I'm wondering how you think this kind of information about vaccines and information or misinformation, how it spreads and, and why you think some people are so starkly pro or against vaccines. Well, the, the, the backdrop is that vaccination is deeply unintuitive. And in fact, there's been opposition to vaccination for as long as there's been vaccination. When, when Jenner uh, popularized the smallpox uh, vac vaccine, there were, I'm sure you've seen the caricatures of cow heads growing out of people's uh, arms. And, um, uh, I, I, uh, and that was in the 18th century. And I remember even as a child in the 60s when we were getting the oral uh, polio vaccine. There was one child who refused to take it. And he, uh, after the nurse spooned this uh, red syrup into his mouth, he uh, turned to the class, opened his mouth with the syrup on his tongue, and then uh, conspicuously spat it out. This is the polio vaccine. And we're, going, wow. we're, we're, we're talking like you know, 50, almost 60 years ago. Uh, and the reason that it's so, uh, uh, why there's been this undercurrent of vaccine resistance is that it's, it's deeply unintuitive. I mean, our mental model of disease is that it comes from some external contaminant or adulterant or pollutant that, in, that uh, infects the body. The body being, uh, uh, when it's pure and clean, it, that means we're healthy. When there's some contaminant that it, it infiltrates or invades, that's what makes us sick. That's why so much folk medicine consists of various forms of purging and bloodletting and sweating and cupping uh, that uh, intuitively we try to expel the foreign contaminant. Uh, now, uh, what is vac vaccination? It consists of taking a dose of the very thing that makes you sick and injecting it into your tissues. Now, of course, we know from immunology that that you know, does have a rationale, namely it, it potentiates your immune system. But still, it, it is, it, you know, it, the concept is deeply icky. So that's what we're already pushing against. We've got to overcome that intuition to get people to accept vaccines. And part of it is, well, look, vaccines have saved 300 people from smallpox in the 20th century alone. But, you know, that's a number. It's an argument. And uh, people don't intuitively accept uh, arguments based on numbers. They can consciously. But a lot of that depends on trust of the source. That is... Do the people of the white in the white coats kind of have my interests at heart? Are they? Do they know what they're talking about? Uh, you know, even I. I mean, I'm you know I, I'm a scientist and I do trust them. But you know, if you were asking me to explain in any detail how vaccines work, I say, well, something about you know antibodies, immune system. You know, basically, I take it on trust. Um, you know, good thing that I do, and I'm uh, here. I am. I'm I'm, I'm alive and, and well, and I think vaccines have something to do with that. Uh, but still, it does mean that we have to safeguard the credibility of the public health establishment. Uh, and that gets back to the opening of our conversation, namely being prepared to justify their opinions as opposed to force feeding a dogma and avoiding uh, gratuitous politicization so that vaccines don't become a identity badge or a loyalty flag of your political coalition. Because we, we do know that people fall into coalitions, into tribes, based on all kinds of crazy pretexts. Uh, for a lot of human history, it was religion. How many gods do you believe in? Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, and who are they? Uh, that has been superseded in, modern, in the modern West by politics. You know, are you on, on the right or on the left? That, those, that's our new religion. And we've got to avoid aligning uh, a scientific consensus with uh, either side of that polarizing split. Mm. It's interesting because um, one of the things I think that this vaccine debate also opens up is the question around free speech and with no platforming, as we know, 
It was due to other things as well, but Donald Trump, for example, was taken off Twitter, now X, as a result of spewing what we clearly take as misinformation, but what other people took as either evidently true or true with evidence. How would you, like, wh- where do you think the limits of that, of that free speech well, are whilst trying to make, no, go ahead. Yes, I mean, I think that uh, even the staunchest free speech advocates, and in the United, the United States is the world's uh, bastion of, of uh, free mm-hmm. speech. We have far more liberal laws than, than uh, most other Western democracies. Um, uh, for example, in the United States, hate speech is constitutionally protected. Uh, we don't have laws against Holocaust denial, as many European countries do. But even even in the United States, even the ultra speech libertarian uh, United States, the uh, there are recognized limits, uh, un- constitutionally unprotected speech, uh, o- obvious things like crimes that by their very definition involve speech like extortion, like bribery, uh, the uh, uh, defamation, but incitement to imminent lawless activity is another category that is not protected. And uh, if there were, uh, and if a private platform like X were to adopt a free speech respecting policy, uh, I I think that people would, uh, even the the free speech near absolutists would say, well, it would be okay to uh, draw the line when it comes to encouraging violence. And so if the argument for removing Trump's account was that he did incite violence, that, that may be a defensible line. If it's that you know he's a, uh, a right-wing fascist populist and we don't like that kind of people here, that I think uh, would, would, uh, would, would not cross the line that ought to be protected. Although again, the other, another distinction of course is that a private uh, platform should be able to do whatever it wants. I mean, that's its free speech. Um, and so it's the same rules that apply to government restrictions may not apply, necessarily apply to private for-profit platforms like X. Now, on the other side, one could say, well, yeah, that's technically true, but it has become so influential that it has become like a, a quasi-public space. I think it'd be, you'd, it'd be hard to push that argument too far, but that is an argument mm. that, uh, that could mm. be made. I'm interested what you'd think about so uh, no platforming is a big topic in the Oxford Union right now. And I'm interested in where you would draw that line. Incitement to violence, of course, I would agree. But for example, a speaker called Kathleen Stock, I'm not sure if you're familiar with her, came to the Oxford Union um, and she has scra- trans skeptical views, essentially. Um, and I'm, I wonder whether you think that would be a case for no platforming or as, as much as they're legally allowed, where do you think the line should be drawn for a, a platform like the Oxford Union, which can spread? potentially harmful information. Well, then it, that, that speaks really to the mission of a university where the laws that apply to uh, the, the, the public sphere have to be uh, adapted to the special uh, context of a university. What's a university all about? Uh, why do we enjoy, we, meaning uh, speaking as a professor, uh, enjoy certain perquisites and privileges? Um, and that's because we're the place where, in, in theory, idea, knowledge is discovered and transmitted. And that means that universities do, I think, have a special obligation to give a wide berth to speech and opinions, because the only way you can discover knowledge is if people can broach ideas and evaluate them. Uh, no one is omniscient, no one is infallible, and if you're in the business of discovering knowledge, that means you can't have uh, you know, commissars and priests and censors deciding uh, which opinions may, uh, may or may not be expressed. Now, of course, universities have to engage in quality control. Not every crackpot can get up on a soap, soapbox and expect to be uh, published in, a, in an academic journal or be, be allowed to teach a course at Oxford or, or at Harvard. But that judgment of quality, do you have sources? Can you cite them? Do you have arguments? Do you have evidence? Uh, has to be distinguished from uh, opinions that you don't like because they're unfamiliar or they clash with your ideology. And in the case of, Kate, say, Kathleen Stock, who's, who, whose opinions are, uh, even if one may disagree with them, they are certainly perfectly uh, well argued. I mean, she is a philosopher, as I understand it, and that, you know, that, that, that's what philosophers do, that's what she does. Um, and I, it's 
completely absurd to not allow her to be heard because the ideas are so dangerous or so poisonous that even hearing them um, uh, harms you, let alone refuting them. So uh, at a university, it, uh, universities are well deserving of uh, contempt and scorn and ridicule for censoring voices like Kathleen Stock. I mean, not only are they not crazy beliefs, but they might even be um, defensible. They might be, even be correct by our best standards. I, uh, I feel, interestingly, a lot of intellectuals who have spoken to me would agree with you. Peter Singer agrees uh, that it's ridiculous to no platform her. Jeff McMahon uh, agreed with platforming her. I'm, I'm curious, do you think, as someone who's obviously very familiar with the power of language and uh, language as a speech act as well as a psychologist and a linguist, what do you think about taboo and its effect in societal discourse? Uh, do you think that perhaps by not addressing what could be classified as taboo topics, that it could maybe make them more powerful or even incite the, the opposite side to, to become more restless at the fact that their beliefs might be suppressed? Yeah, it's a, uh, and you know, taboo is a powerful psychological phenomenon. There is a, a psychologist uh, named Philip Tetlock who studied the, uh, the psychology of taboo. Uh, that is ideas that are considered immoral to think. And he gives us examples, um, uh, what he calls um, uh, forbidden base rates. Uh, if you are a rational thinker, you should endorse applying uh, the, the famous rule of the Reverend Thomas Bayes to your, assess, your assessment of, of um, uh, uh, ideas based on evidence, namely you begin with a prior, uh, that is how likely is something to be true uh, before you've even looked at the evidence so that you've got some way of calibrating how seriously you, you, you take the evidence. And there are certain base rates, which is the most straightforward way of calculating a prior, that uh, are considered immoral. Like, for example, racial base rates. If you are uh, admitting someone to university, if you are trying someone for a crime, should you go to the data and say, well, how often do people of that race uh, tend to commit crimes? And so we will uh, convict this person of less evidence if they belong to a racial group that um, uh, on average commits more crime. Now, I think most of us would recoil. I mean, we consider that uh, just uh, uh, you know, just uh, e evil thought to think, even though it is a uh, uh, recommended as as a normative principle by our best uh, guideline to adjusting credence and beliefs according to strength of evidence, namely Bayes' rule. And uh, so that that the and studies have shown that if you even raise that possibility with people. Um, they often recoil. Now, there's some contexts in which we do apply base rates. Um, in, in, uh, uh, young people have to pay more for car insurance than old people. Even a, uh, in, in some way, that's unfair to younger people who might be safer drivers than older people. But there are some cases where we say, yeah, you should be a Bayesian and apply the base rates, and that's okay. Others where it is absolutely forbidden. Uh, and you know, for, for justifiable reasons, that's an example of a, uh, of a taboo. Um, another one is um, ta what uh, Tetla calls taboo trade-offs. Uh, in any kind of sensible policy, uh, and in fact, we talked about this earlier, there are always costs and benefits. There's nothing that is you know, always good and never bad or vice versa. Um, and you can't just do one thing. So if you're implementing a policy, there's going to be positives and negatives. But there are some of these trade-offs that Tetlock points out that people consider taboo, uh, such as weighing off money against human lives. Uh, can you, uh, you, even though you, you kind of got to do that, if you're a city, if you're a mayor or a city council, you got to decide, should we pay uh, millions and millions of pounds to build a pedestrian overpass that will save lives of people who won't be killed by uh, collisions with cars? But that means we have less money to spend on schools and health clinics and so on. Well, you know, you just can't get away from thinking how much money is a human worth, life, life worth. And you know, life insurance companies and safety regulators, they don't like to publicize it, but they actually do have such a figure. Uh, however, if you bring it out into the open, people have an ick reaction and they consider it evil. Uh, and so you even have politicians saying nonsensical things like uh, we can't put a value on human life. 
Uh, we should protect the environment no matter what it costs. Uh, we must uh, look after our senior citizens, and uh, it would be you know, t uh, terrible to, to, to think about what it, what it costs us. How can you put a price on the well-being of our, our, our veterans and our seniors? Uh, that's another example of a, uh, of a taboo thought. Now, in uh, a academia, of course, we should be, in general, challenging taboos. We know that some of the past taboos have gotten in the way of human progress, human well-being. Galileo's endorsement of the, uh, the, the heliocentric theory of the solar system, Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, you know, theories of, of um, or uh, the moral case for gay marriage, for uh, women's suffrage, uh, for abolition of slavery, all in their time were, there were sectors of society that consider those taboo. And so in general, uh, challenging taboos is one of the things that uh, intellectuals and scholars and, and activists ought to do. Although it is, uh, a case could be made that some taboos are benign and should be respected in the same way that in uh, everyday social interactions, there are some things that we know are true and that we, we don't say. Um, you know, you don't have to bring up the fact that someone is you know, fat or has a speech impediment, or, uh, and, and we consider that to be okay. Uh, is that the case for intellectual uh, investigation? Should we, for example, uh, relentlessly study the uh, uh, racial or religious differences in uh, school performance, in uh, commission of different kinds of crimes? There could be an argument that just as in polite society, there's some things that we know that we don't make explicit, uh, science being a part of society might sometimes say, uh, don't, don't go there. We'll just choose to study other things. So anyway, that's, I'm not going to come down on one side or the other of the debate, but I will, uh, that, that those are the issues at play. And I'll mention one more because you do men you, you mentioned that I am a, uh, among other things, a, a linguist. And in my book, The Stuff of Thought, I had, a, I had a chapter on taboo language. It's called The Seven Words You Can't Say on Television, uh, that's, which is the title of a comedy routine by the American comedian George Carlin. Uh, on why uh, there, there are certain words that just uttering them are taboo. Traditionally, these would you like words... to list them for us? <laughs> Pardon me. I, I said, I, there, like there's some that I, well, you know, <laughs> shit, fuck, cunt, asshole, tits. Um, there are. Uh, it used to be damn, hell, Jesus Christ, uh, bloody. Oh, okay. Used to be a, a taboo. Um, mm -hmm. If wow. if you've seen the play, the Shaw play, Pygmalion, or the uh, musical adaptation. Uh, my Fair Lady, you remember that there's a scene where Eliza Doolittle says, not bloody likely, and it not only shocked her fictional uh, companions in the scene, but when it was shown on the British stage in 1913, it scandalized the audience that someone on the <laughs> stage said, said bloody. In fact, uh, and now that changed. In fact, I should, I should clarify what I said. By the time Pygmalion, the stage play, was adapted to My Fair Lady, the Broadway musical, uh, audiences had gotten so used to the word bloody that um, the, the scene just wouldn't have worked anymore. No one would have understood why the uh, people were so offended. And so they rewrote the scene so that Eliza Doolittle uh, at the Ascot races shouted out, move your bloomin' arse to the, uh, uh, at, at the horses, the horse and jockey. And that was the shocker by 1950s sensibilities. You know, nowadays, uh, you know, that wouldn't be a shock, but it was set, of course, in an earlier time. So audiences understood that by the standards of the day, that was taboo. Uh, now, we still have taboos, and there's one that I think I'm, I'm not even going to mention, although I, I have in, in, in uh, my previous talks, and I, and I did in the book, and that is words for racial minorities, such as the word that in the United States we have to refer to as the N-word. Uh, now, I, uh, as, as someone who wants to understand how language works, and more generally someone who just wants to uh, uh, kind of crack the nut of human nature, human interaction, human behavior, I think it's absurd that, uh, that, that you, you, you uh, cannot utter the word. Uh, philosophers distinguish between using a word and mentioning a word. Uh, using meaning it is woven into conversation with its customary meaning and connotation. Mention means you're a linguist, you're a philosopher, you're a scholar, you're putting it in quotation marks, and you're talking about the word qua word. 
Now, we now have a taboo against even mentioning the so-called N-word. Um, I have in the past. I think I'm not going to now because sensibilities have changed. Uh, I think it's okay, but I, I uh, don't particularly want to rain uh, abuse on, on me or, for that matter, you guys by actually blurting it out, even though I think there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, in, partic- in fact, I think there is a benefit to blurting it out because it, as someone who believes that the more we understand about ourselves, the better off we are, and the more we understand about the world, uh, the idea that actually speaking a word can alter reality is a kind of primitive thinking, sometimes called word magic. It's behind spells and curses uh, and, and, and blessings. Um, but the first lesson of linguistics is that just going, blah, 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 it's not can't change the word by itself. The only way that language has an effect on the world is by the way in which uh, uh, listeners uh, interpret the sound and the con- particular convention that that sound corresponds to some thought, some meaning, some intention. Uh, and, and the idea that actually even being a linguist and uh, discussing the word can itself somehow harm the members of that racial minority is a bit of primitive thinking that I think we uh, would be better off transcending. That is having the insight, oh, language is a bunch of con- is a convention. It is not a way of uh, impinging on the world. Uh, but that's the world we live in, and that's just a battle that I'm not going to fight uh, today here. Yeah, I mean, the, just to push back on that a little bit from a linguistic perspective, I think the, the fact that it's convention actually might support the use of not saying it, because I think that convention makes the utterance of the word a speech act, i.e. doing more than just saying. Um, and that speech act is demonstrating perhaps a disregard for that taboo, and as a result, a disregard for that racial minority, whether or not theoretically it might be okay to mention as opposed to use the word. I'm not sure if you know what I mean. I mean, you, you, you could say that. It, seem, it, it, it uh, seems to me, again, I'm not going to, f- I might be a little hypocritical here because I'm not going to flout it here and now. Um, but uh, uh, when we adopt the stance of analysts, of thinkers, of scientists, of scholars, uh, then of course it is not the speech act of disrespecting or encouraging contempt for the group. It is the speech act of uh, uh, analyzing our own practices, our own behavior, our own norms. And you know, I, I think we public discourse should be at a level where you could appreciate that difference. That is, you can put something under the microscope, just as if you're, if you're an obstetrician uh, and you discuss the you know, female genitalia and you even put a slide up, uh, or if you're, uh, you're a breast cancer surgeon, uh, you know, that's not pornography. And uh, to say that, say, at a, at a scientific conference, uh, or for that matter, at a health clinic, where you should never show a picture of a breast because that's, you know, that's what, you know, uh, Pornhub does, you know, that would be absurd. Uh, and and uh, you know, I, I, I think, although hypocritically, I'm not going to press the point I have in the past, but I'm not going to do it here, that, uh, that discussing, say, the, the N word, the C word, the K word, and by actually blurting it out is like showing a... Uh, a diagram of, of the, the breast in a uh, health clinic on self-examination. Mm, so I think I'll leave that up to our listeners before we press the point too much. So in another chapter of your book, Rationality, you discuss game theory. So for our listeners who might not be acquainted, basically game theory is the plotting out of what is individually rational for people in a situation where there's benefits and losses and what can be collectively rational. Now, something that occurred to me from reading that chapter was an argument for nuclear disarmament through game theory. Uh, And I just wanted to see what you thought, Um, because growing up, I always had a severe distaste for it. Um, I used to argue with my family about uh, Hiroshima, for example. Um, But in terms of nuclear armament, I think there's an argument in saying that it changes what's individually rational and what's collectively rational such that they sync up because the threat of being nuclear bombed means that you're significantly less likely to engage in conflict because of the amount of destruction that can come about. And so it can lead to a kind of um, forced ceasefire. I I wonder what you think of that. Yes, there is. I, I, um, in an earlier book, the better angels of our nature. And again, I, I, in a, in a, uh, subsequent book, Enlightenment Now, I discussed the, the theory of the nuclear peace, 
that the reason that we haven't had a world war since 1945 is that the world's nations have been kind of scared straight that the prospect of nuclear war would be so unthinkable, could quite literally lead to the uh, extinction of the human species, that um, it has led uh, at least the superpowers to be skittish about challenging each other on the battlefield. And indeed, the uh, nuclear powers have not fought a war against each other, um, uh, well, ever. I guess the last great power war uh, direct great power war was the United States against China in the Korean War in 1953. Uh, at the time, Korea, uh, China was not a nuclear power. Um, the, the, uh, you know, that, that is an argument. Someone, uh, there was one scholar who suggested the nuclear bomb be given the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, <laughs> You know, I, 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 would, I would not nominate it and I would not vote for it. Um, and the, some problems with the nuclear peace theory, just in terms of, first of all, it's an explanation as to why there has been a decline in war. Um, uh, it, it may be that the role of nuclear weapons may be uh, superfluous for a couple of reasons. One of them is that conventional armies are already so powerful and would be so massively destructive that no one wanted a rematch of, of uh, World War II even if nukes were kept off the table. Uh, the, and World War II did stupendous damage, and the, the number of deaths in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were you know, a drop in the bucket compared to the 55 million or so people who died in World War II. Um, and so one of them is that there's already deter conventional deterrence, which may have uh, kept, the, kept the peace. Another one is that because nuclear weapons are so unthinkably destructive, there's a sense in which they are almost a bluff. Uh, and in fact, there are many cases in which wars have been fought between a non-nuclear power and a nuclear power uh, because the non-nuclear power knew that the nuclear power would not uh, actually use the weapon. Uh, for one thing, they're so indiscriminately destructive that um, it would the destruction would be out of proportion to what would hope to be gained. Uh, you, do you really want to occupy a territory that's just been nuked and it is seething with radioactivity? Clouds can blow, they fall out right back on you. So a lot of reasons why a country in possession of nuclear weapons would not uh, routinely use them. Uh, but just to give some examples, uh, uh, one, one close to home for the, the UK is uh, in uh, the early 1980s, Argentina tried to take back the Falkland Islands. Uh, Britain was a nuclear power, Argentina wasn't, because they knew that, that Margaret Thatcher was not going to nuke Buenos Aires, no matter what. A more recent example is that um, the uh, uh, Hamas has challenged Israel, and um, knowing that Israel, a nuclear power, is not going to nuke Gaza. Um, Saddam Hussein defied the United States in uh, uh, 03. Um, anyway, plen plenty of examples. Uh, and the final argument against this, even though I, I do recognize the argument for it, is that if there is a miscalculation, a slip up, a uh, brinksmanship, um, that is, given that the use of nuclear weapons could be a bluff, uh, so far has been a bluff, could a uh, nuclear power press its luck and uh, assume that the other side will uh, back down short of nuclear weapons, but be wrong, um, uh, in which case two nuclear powers could, uh, low probability, but high damage, uh, uh, actually engage in a nuclear war that would be just uh, unthinkably catastrophic. So an analogy has been drawn between the, the teenager's game of chicken, that uh, this is the game in which two teenagers approach each other on a narrow highway at high speed, and the first to swerve um, is the chicken and loses, loses faith, face, I mean, uh, and, and nuclear war has been, uh, nuclear confrontation has been likened to the teenager's game of chicken. And it's, it, it is a bit of uh, a counterintuitive finding from game theory is that a strategy for winning a chicken is to sacrifice control. If you lock your steering wheel with an anti-theft device and put a brick on the accelerator and then you know, climb into the back seat, then the other guy has no choice but to swerve. The problem being, what happens if both teenagers lock their steering wheel and put the brick on the accelerator at the same time? Then you've got catastrophe and they, and they uh, both uh, lose, much worse than the losing face. And so given how horrendous the consequences of a uh, mutual bluff calling could be, 
uh, it, the world would be better off without them. It's it's fascinating to me how high volatility <laughs> nuclear energy in general is. You have Germany, who, for example, have been you know getting rid of the nuclear power plants, whereas other people are a bit shocked because nuclear power is arguably better for the environment. There is a feeling, I think, among a lot of people that that there's almost a guarantee that you know we're, we're safe from nuclear war to an extent. It almost to some people feels at the back of their mind like, oh well, that's not really going to happen. But I'm I'm curious. Do you think there is that fe- the that real risk that nuclear war does break out and that's the end, or do you think it's it's something which ultimately humans will be clever enough to to stop? Well, um, you know. S- uh, Vladimir Putin has recently reminded us that the uh, nuclear option is not as taboo as we once thought because he did uh, spew rhetoric at the outset of the uh, invasion of Ukraine that as far as he was concerned, nuclear weapons were not off the table, that he might, he, he might, he might use them. Now, I think you know, it almost certainly was a bluff. Um, and he was referring to tactical so-called battlefield nuclear weapons rather than strategic nuclear weapons of you know, bombing and uh, you know, obliterating an entire city. Um, but because the, uh, going back to taboo, uh, a benevolent taboo that the world has enjoyed has been the so-called nuclear taboo. Namely, it's kind of been unthinkable uh, as a routine weapon of war, even for countries that possess it. Uh, and, and we might even be thankful for it. And, and Putin was jet- weakening the nuclear taboo by even bringing it up as a possible option. And then one could worry that once that taboo has been breached, once the line had been crossed, well, the other guy's using nuclear weapons, so uh, we're entitled to retaliate in kind. And even a small battlefield or so-called tactical nuclear weapon could lead to a cycle of retaliation that ended in catastrophe once the taboo had been uh, breached. Uh, But anyway, whatever complacency the world might have had, well, certainly the world had was by no means complacent in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, in the, uh, there were you know, massive ban the bomb demonstrations in Britain in the 60s. Uh, in the 80s, when Ronald Reagan uh, wanted to introduce medium range nuclear forces into Europe, there were massive uh, Europe, European protests. There was a uh, television um, docudramas that tried to illustrate the horror of nuclear war that got a lot of attention. You're right that that had faded with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. But it is, it, it was put back on the table by Putin's breaching of, of the, uh, the, the, the nuclear taboo. And, um, uh, you know, whether it would be a good thing for people to be reminded of this sort of Damocles and perhaps renew the push to abolish nuclear weapons, um, you know, that, that, that may not be such a terrible thing to, to renew that horror and, and, and uh, put it to use. Now, what would not be good is if that bled over into nuclear power, which is uh, uh, really a kind of, a, it's a different technology. Nuclear power plants, even if one were to melt down, would, cannot explode like a nuclear weapon. And there is no... Uh, easy pathway from nuclear energy to nuclear weapons. There are dozens of countries that have nuclear power, but only um, nine that have nuclear weapons. And there's some, there's at least uh, one country that has nuclear weapons, but no nuclear power, namely uh, Israel. Uh, So they're not the same thing. And indeed the, if the nuclear, if the taboo against nuclear weapons uh, bleeds over into a uh, distrust of nuclear power, uh, that would be extremely unfortunate, as Germany has uh, has shown by, um, I, I think, prematurely and immaturely closing its nuclear power plants after the Fukushima disaster, and therefore being more vulnerable to uh, cut off of, na- of uh, gas from Russia, of uh, carbon emissions that uh, have not declined, because if you don't have nuclear power, then you're going to uh, you're going to you're going to burn fossil fuels. Um, the world needs energy, loves energy, is going to want more and more and more energy as poorer parts of the world deservedly try to catch up with the, uh, the developed West. Uh, energy is good. And uh, the only 
truly scalable carbon-free source of energy is nuclear power. Uh, it would be foolish to um, <clears throat> uh, shut down the plants that we have or to not develop new ones out of uh, fear of nuclear weapons, which are uh, just a, a, a different animal. It, it reminds me of Enlightenment now and, and this idea of progress. So perhaps by getting rid of the, this nuclear energy, Germany is not making progress. Uh, America as well, in many ways, is experiencing regression. I, w- I was wondering what, what do you think the, the potential uh, damage will be if, if Trump gets reelected? Uh, and do you think it's, it's likely for him to be reelected now? It's, as it's a very, obviously, a pertinent and, and timely discussion. Yes, well, it could be. We 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 don't know, uh, but it, it it could be disastrous. He has threatened to uh, take actions that are like that of a, a, a tin pot police state dictator on his first day of office, uh, of uh, jailing his opponents and uh, and, and, and journalists, and uh, he's talked about um, violating the law against. Um, President serving more than two consecutive terms, which is, of course, what what uh, autocrats and dictators do. They install themselves for life. Um, he would be disastrous for climate action. Uh, there'd be, you know, all, uh, many many things to fear. Now, uh, how likely is it? The you know, opinion polls at this stage are misleading. I put a little more faith in prediction markets where people have uh, put money on the line, and they are. Putting it at this point, you know, pretty close to 50-50. I haven't checked in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I suspect I haven't uh, put put money on the line in a prediction market, although I might. Um, I, I suspect it's less likely than not, simply because the uh, as election day draws nearer, the reality of a Trump presidency and all the negatives that led him to lose the popular vote twice will become stronger, especially as the trials that have uh, the, the indictments uh, are uh, proceed and he's just in a negative light as a, an accused criminal. Now, this won't affect his so-called base, the, the uh, 25% of voters who consider him a, a cult figure, a uh, almost a messiah. They are unshakable but they won't determine the election. It is the, uh, the the sliver of people in between, especially those in uh, the swing states because of the uh, bizarre American system for electing presidents. It's the voters in, in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania that will determine the election. Mm. Uh, so we don't know, and I wouldn't bet a lot of money. Uh, I, I think it's more likely that he will lose, but the chances that he will win are are. are are, are worrying. They are not, not negligible. Mm. Mm. One of the primary arguments in Enlightenment Now, and I think one of the things that you're perhaps most known for, is the idea that even with peaks and troughs, so for example, you might argue that um, Donald Trump being elected was a trough in progress, that generally we're going in the direction of progress. And one thing that worries me, I think, with the United States as, as, as it relates to progress is the fact of kind of this lack of separation between the executive and the judiciary. So Trump being able to elect three officials onto the Supreme Court. And I'm wondering what you think the negative knock-on effects of that might be and whether that might lead to a more general and long-term regression um, in, well, it, in it, America's it, liberal state. Yeah, go on. It, I mean, it could. And the uh, you know, I take pains to point out that the United States, as uh, salient and conspicuous as it is, is not the, the, is not the world. It's not even the world of... Uh, developed democracies. Uh, we are, a, a, uh, and we, and this is my, my adopted country because I'm, I'm a Canadian. Uh, the United States is a weird country. I mean, it's a weird, demo- weird developed democracy. And in uh, many, many measures, it is an outlier. Uh, and and you know, most of them uh, worse. That is, we don't live as long. We're not as happy. We have higher rates of mental illness, higher rates of obesity, higher rates of drug addiction, higher rates of incarceration, higher rates of violent crime. Uh, so the United States already is behind the curve in terms of what you might consider uh, uh, global progress. And, and and yeah, it could get worse. There's no the fact that progress uh, on average has has happened in uh, much of the world 
doesn't mean it is guaranteed to continue everywhere, even in most of the world, because it's not a mystical force. It's not a law of nature. It just means that when people apply their brain power to solving problems um, and the problems that they are solving are how do we make people better off, healthier, happier, safer, then uh, you know, every once in a while we, we, we succeed at doing that. And if we keep the solutions and try not to repeat our mistakes, then progress can happen. But it's, uh, that, that's all the progress consists of. It doesn't happen by itself. And if the historical forces that have uh, caused progress, namely humanistic values and the application of reason and science, if you turn those down, if you stop them, then progress will stop because progress, that's all that uh, progress is and, and it doesn't happen by itself. Yeah, I think that's one of the maybe the biggest mi misconceptions about your work, even in discussions with my friends, is that you're sort of a Whiggish historian. So for our listeners who don't know, that's the idea that progress is sort of inevitable. Um, and yeah, I like your emphasis on on forcing that progress through. So I wanted to ask you about one potential way um, that we can do that. We had Peter Singer on the podcast, or I'm sure you know, who's a big uh, proponent of effective altruism. And like you say, the reduction in absolute poverty in the last 200 years from 90, 95% to now something like 13 has been incredible. And I wonder whether you think in the Western world and in, in certainly p for people who are affluent, whether we should be putting more of our money towards solving that problem and forcing that progress through. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, which problem are you now referring to? Uh, uh, the problem of absolute poverty, uh, starvation, oh, etc. Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, I, I do. And, and uh, I'm... Uh the uh, and the the idea of effective altruism, which has recently taken a beating by guilt by association, because Sam Bankman Fried rather cynically claimed to be an effective altruist in, in earning his claiming to want to earn as much money and give it away to charity. Um, uh, you know that that was uh, you know almost certainly uh, you know cynical and insincere, but it unfortunately tainted the very idea of effective altruism. But I think the idea is utterly sound. Namely, uh, if you are devoting uh, your career to making humanity better off, if you are uh, engaged in philanthropy and, and donations, and you should do more, as, as Singer has argued, you should know where, uh, where that money, where those hours will, will do the most good. So uh, I think that's a, a, an excellent idea. Now, I, I won't say this is counter singer it's uh, maybe complementary but when we say that the the massive amount of uh, reduction of uh poverty on the order of uh, 130,000 people a, a day uh for the last 30 years has not been powered by philanthropy it's not that lots and lots of people are giving to um, uh, effective charities but to economic development and one could one could argue that the moral imperative may be in as in so far as we can do it to uh, encourage globalization and economic development as the way to do the most good in the sense of lifting the most people out of extreme poverty. But there's still, there's only so much that uh, individuals can do to speed uh, economic development along, but they can give more to charity and that certainly, uh, to effective charities. And we know that you know, that, that really does save lives. You, you mentioned how income inequality is is not a fundamental factor in human well-being, and you provide some data for this claim. I was wondering how you, you square that with, with maybe Singer's ideas, or if you could just explain it a little bit for our for listeners in general. Yeah, I think you know, Singer's ideas actually don't really refer to inequality. They refer to poverty. Uh, that is, if someone's child dies, um, then uh, the, the size of, of, of uh, you know, Elon Musk's house is, is irrelevant. Um, what the, the question is, do they have, do people have enough money to feed themselves, to, to send their kids to school, to enjoy the, you know, the basic pleasures of life? Uh, now, if you uh, think in zero sum terms that wealth is a, global wealth is, a, is one lump, and if some people have more, that means that other people have less, then you could equate inequality and poverty. But we know that uh, wealth is you know, massively elastic that uh, uh, 200 years ago, 90% of the world lived in what we would today call extreme poverty. Now it's less than 9%. Uh, and that's because we, we create wealth. And uh, uh, within 
that within countries, there's a certain amount of, of uh, uh, trade-off. Every developed country has progressive taxation and has redistribution. Uh, but still, in over the course of the of, of human history and, and looking globally, uh, the the reason that we have fewer poor people is not that there are fewer rich people; it's that the whole world has gotten richer. And so the imperative, uh, the, the moral imperative, is not that everyone have the same. The moral imperative is that everyone has uh, enough. If everyone is poor. Uh, that, that is not an improvement. But if uh, no one, or at least as few people as possible, are starving, are hungry, are uh, uneducated, are living miserable lives, you know, that, that is where our moral energy should be concentrated. Yeah, I just want to push back on that a little bit, because I know the argument, sort of not for inequality, but against a- anti-equality maybe, is kind of a pushback of this um, sort of what is quite common in left wing discourse, which is that CEOs, for example, are, are, are taking a disproportionate amount of money. Um, but I think, nonetheless, even if inequality is not intrinsically bad, nonetheless, the amounts being taken, even if the pie can grow, are leading to what I would see as unjustifiable inequalities. So, for example, since 1978, CEO pay has risen by 1,200%, worker pay by 15%. No matter how much the pie grows, most of the pie is still giving, being given to the CEOs. Um, so that, that's sort of how I'd push back and say maybe that the inequality is representative of something deeper rather than just intrinsically inequality being bad. Uh, you know, one could. Of course, it doesn't follow, by the way, that this, if the CEO pay has increased that much more that they're getting the majority of the money because there's only one CEO and there are an awful lot of workers. Um, and indeed, some of that inequality, a lot of it, is mitigated by... Uh, taxes and, and uh, transfers that the uh, when you take into account the various government benefits, even for a country like the United States, which is relatively stingy, uh, you know we have in the United States there's a, there's a lot of redistribution that uh, even though the, the right wing politicians uh, you know rail against it, you know we've got it. It's popular. It's not going to go away. It's probably going to increase, and, and that's probably a, a, a good thing. But yes, I mean not to not to disagree that. So the system is probably out of kilter because of misaligned incentives that the tax code probably uh, tilts toward it being too easy for CEOs to get too much. Uh, that uh, uh, you know, I, I, I do recognize that argument. Now we have only four minutes, so I'm going to suggest that if whatever you want to wrap up with, we should get to that now. I think obviously we haven't mentioned things like UBI, but we've touched upon some really important topics and we were wondering if there was any concluding thoughts you might leave our listeners with something perhaps for 2024 and and for these modern sensibilities, uh, a final message perhaps. I guess the final thing, and this is uh, one of my recent obsessions as the uh, someone in academia who's pushing back against restrictions on speech and thought, is and, and as a cognitive psychologist, that's uh, you know, kind of my background, what, what I do, that there is a rationale for protecting academic freedom and freedom of speech. And that simply is that uh, we're, uh, as humans, we are saddled with lots of cognitive biases and, and, and fallacies. We all think that we're right and that the other guy is stupid and evil. But of course, not all of us could be, be right about that. Uh, that knowledge is good, that the, all of the progress that we've talked about, the fact that uh, people have been lifted out of poverty, that uh, vaccines have saved hundreds of millions of lives, come from uh, the development of knowledge. And the development of knowledge doesn't come from you know, brilliant people sharing their, uh, their truth with us. It comes from a community of people broaching hypotheses and other people saying what's wrong with them. And if you disable that process by shutting people up or punishing them for uh, unpopular beliefs, you're shutting off the engine by which we progress is possible, namely uh, knowledge. And that so we should, as humble members of a flawed species, homo sapiens, with all of our cognitive biases, should protect academic freedom as our only way that we collectively can bumble toward toward knowledge and truth. Thank you very much. Listeners, 
This has been the Loaf Podcast with Stephen Pinker. We've touched upon some slightly controversial topics and you guys can make up your mind whether or not you agree with them. Leave your thoughts in the comments and please like and subscribe to keep supporting us. Thank you so much, Stephen, for your time. We really appreciate it and, and hope you enjoyed it. Uh, good, luck, good luck to you and thanks again for having me. Thank you very much. This has been the Loaf Podcast. Out. Out.